G'day nerds. So today we're going to talk about the quantum mechanical model of the atom, or Schrodinger's model. And this is the model that he built to, along with others, obviously, scientists tend to work with other people, but, but he built upon the work of Bohr to sort of refine it, not replace it. Now by the end of this, you should be able to explain the quantum mechanical model of the atom and how the, the different orbitals all fit together. When you can do that, you should be able to predict the SPDF notation as well as the electron orbital box notation of an atom. And this will allow you to predict where electrons are most likely to be. So this is your vocabulary for the lesson. If I could just get you to pause the video here, write these down, and you'll have something to refer back to as we move along. So now we're going to talk about the Schrodinger model of the atom, or the quantum mechanical model. And in this case, you've always seen atoms with a nucleus and electrons spinning around it in circles. Well, we're refining that a little bit, right? So now we have the what we call the SPDF orbitals. So Schrodinger has us using probability. And in this case, electrons spin around the nucleus in orbitals. For example, the first orbital is the S orbital, and that's one here. And it, the electrons just going to spin around the nucleus in a spherical shape. But then, larger than that, when we have more, we're going to have the P orbitals. And the P orbitals spin like this. So that's one P orbital. Then we've got another P orbital. You'll see that there are three P orbitals. We'll do this. And a third one. And this becomes a three-dimensional shape, and that's why we've got the x, y, z axes. axes. So the electrons actually spin in pairs within these little orbitals. Okay. So in the p shell, there are three orbitals, and the maximum that we can have in each orbital is two, or pairs, so electron pairs. When we don't have enough electrons to fill up that entire orbital, or sorry, that entire shell, so the p shell, when we don't have enough electrons for that, we'll find that we have some orbitals only have one electron, a lone electron. And these tend to be fairly reactive, actually. So electrons, when they're in pairs, have opposite spins. And what this means is if one electron is going this, spinning this way around the orbital, the other electron is spinning the other direction around the orbital. That's not quite true, but that's a good way to visualize it for what we're doing. So remember, this is aimed at high school, and that is a I think that's quite, a, that's an advanced enough explanation for this. So electrons orbit in the same direction when they, they're not in pairs, right? So if we've got one orbital spinning around this way, we'll have, the other one will be spinning the same direction, and this one will be spinning the same direction, and we call those parallel spins. So orbitals, they're based on probability, and this is a really interesting idea. What this means is we no longer say that an electron is here at point x. We say that the electron is most likely to be at point x, or it's most likely to be in one of in this orbital. So we don't say that the electron is here, we say it looks like this. In other words, it's most likely the electron's here, but it's less probable it's here, but it's still possible. And the further out the lower the probability becomes. S orbitals have two electrons. So in here there are two electrons. P orbitals hold six, but what this actually means is each of these orbitals in the, the P orbital energy level holds two electrons each. So there'll be two here and there, and they'll be moving in different directions. One there, moving in different directions, and one there, moving in different directions. So we see that all up there's going to be six. Now, when we look at the D orbitals, we find that D orbitals can hold 10 electrons, but on this diagram here, only the light blue, the light blue ones, are the d orbitals, the rest of the electrons, the rest of the orbitals, sorry, on there are the surrounding p orbitals, so we can see there's the p, there's the p, more p orbitals, there's the s orbital in the middle there, and so that's how that kind of fills out, right? So what we've got here is two electrons there, two electrons there, all up to we get 10 electrons, and the f orbitals will hold 14 electrons all up with seven separate orbitals, seven separate orbitals. So it's complex, it's hard, it's much trickier than the previous version. So let's look at how we work out, so let's look at the rules for electron placement. Now we said at the beginning you should be able to predict where electrons are going to be. This is how we do it. There are three rules. The first one is the Aufbau, which means building up, it's a German word, principle. 
electrons enter the orbital in the lowest energy first. In other words, the s shell, the s orbitals, will be filled up first, then the 2s, then the 2p. And we can see that happens. At no point is there an empty 1s orbital while other orbitals along the back ends are still being filled up. There's the Pauli exclusion principle. This is actually one of the most exciting of all ideas and and if you should do some further research into the connectivity of uh, electrons or fermions and maybe have a look at the a Brian Cox video. So there's one where he talks about it in particular detail. It's really exciting. But the Pauli exclusion principle for us, its implication is that we basically can't have two electrons filling the one space, right? So if you've got an electron with an up spin, that's what this arrow shows. So remember, we have two electrons in each orbital. If you've got one going in one direction, the other electron that's it's going to be in there has to be in the other direction. They can't have the same quantum state, which just means all the numbers that you can use to describe it, essentially. So they can't have the same spin in the same orbital. Then you've got Hunt's rule, which is sometimes called the, the bus seat rule or the urinal rule. And that is that every seat on the bus will fill up before two people sit next to each other. Okay, so every orbit in a subshell, these are little subshells here, like the 2s, the 2p, and all that sort of stuff. Sorry, the, the orbital boxes, that's a subshell within a p. Uh, every orbital in a subshell will be filled up singly before it starts to double up. And we can see that, right? When we get down to neon, we go one, two, three. And again, we talked earlier about how there's if there's some in an orbital with only one electron in each little orbital area, they're all going in the same direction. So these all point up. So we've got one, two, three. And we see that we filled up this whole subshell's orbitals. So they've all got something in it before we started doubling up. So we go down to oxygen, we go up, 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 then down. And then with fluorine, up, 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 down, down. So we fill up with parallel spin before we start putting those with opposite spin in there as well. And those are the three rules that put us together. So how do we write this down? We write this down using, well, two ways, SPDF notation. And that's the three, the four subshells. Now we do this using the diagonal rule. So the diagonal rule we is this one here, right? So the best way to do it is you write one to S, sorry, one to seven S down a page. Then you move down one to two, two to seven P. Then move down to three, three to six D, and 4f to 5f and you need to be careful about it because these help us work out where the electrons are going to be according to a the orbital number and b the orbital name and we'll see that when we get a bit further down it doesn't actually fill up in the order of uh, 1 2 3 4 or just s p d f and we'll see that in a second so what we do is we are, well, let's have a look at sulfur here where we go We've got 16 electrons, so we've got to count these off as we go. We've got 1s, nice. So we've got 1s shell filled, and that ha that holds 2. So we've got a little 2 up here in our sub uh, superscript, a little 2 there. Then we fill up the 2s shell, because we go 1, and then we go back to the top here, down to 2s. So our 2s can hold 2, so we've got 2 up there. And now we've got 4 electrons used up, so we've still got 12 to go. Um, then we go, so we you know, come back up here, we're all back to the start. We've got 2p, so that holds 6, then 3s. Okay, so it goes 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, and then we've got four electrons left, so we go back up the top here, and we go to 3p, which we've only got four electrons left, it can hold 6, so we go 3p, 4. That's that. It's nice and simple, right? Now, that can get really long. Sulfur's only element 16. By the time we get further down the list, it becomes really, really full. So these are our core electrons and these are our valence electrons. Because of the, the way the periodic table is structured, what we can actually do is we can just find what the nearest noble gas is. In this case, the first, the noble gas before this is neon. We put that in brackets because that's, it has all of the core shells and core electrons the same as neon. So it's neon's SPDF notation plus 3s2, 3p4. And we can do that all the way down. So remember the superscript um, says how many electrons are in those orbitals. And it shows the, the order that the orbitals are filled. And that's really important. So we use this diagonal rule to work out what order those orbitals are going to be filled. 
Now let's have a quick look at how this appears on the periodic table and we'll look, talk about silicon in a minute. So, this section, rows 1 and 2, columns 1 and 2, sorry, groups 1 and 2, they are all S electrons. The, the outermost electrons are in S shells. Then we've got the D block. These are the lanthanides and actinides just here. So that's your uh, lanthanides and actinides. Then you've got the D block in the middle and the P block on the end. The lanthanides and actinides are all the F ones. So that's the structure. And we can see that it's really, so there's several ways to predict this. We can look at uh, a periodic table and go, cool, these guys here, these are all our, our P electrons. So these guys all have, and you go one, two, three, four, all the way down to seven. These have a P shell as their last shell. And we fill it up that way. And you use the diagonal rule to check your work. So let's have a look at how to do this. We can write our electron configuration. This is for silicon. It's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2. And that's using the diagonal rule to find our electron configuration. We've already covered that. Let's have a look at our electron orbital diagram. So, sorry, those are our core shells, and these are our valence shells, which means we could just call it neon square brackets, 3s2, 3p2. And that's completely acceptable and awesome. So let's have a look at our orbital diagram. Now let's do this together. Now, we know that the 1s is filled, so we go up, arrow, down arrow. We know that the 2s is filled. Remember we fill it up before we do it. 2p, we know it's all filled, but we've got to check it just in case. I like to do the up arrows first. It does not matter. Just be consistent. 3s, they're filled. And then 3p2, so we go, and that's our electron orbital diagram. Now, Bohr to Schrodinger, how do they relate? Uh, so these are the Bohr shells here, KLMN, and then we've got the subshells and what exists in it. So you've still got two electrons in your K shell because it's only made up of 1s. Your L shell has eight electrons because it's, it's got the 2s and the 2p. M has 18 because it's got the 3s, 2p, 3d, and so forth all the way down. I hope that made a lot of sense. I know it was a long one. I know it was a hard one. If you have any questions, put them in the comments below, and we'll get back to you as quick as we can. Don't forget to subscribe. That way you can keep up with everything we're doing. I, I, I hope that made sense. That was a hard one. And yeah, I'll see you next time. Bye now.